Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. Who in the world are these people? Who are these people? And what is Antichrist? I'm sure that everybody here has heard of the word. And if you've read the book of Revelation, you've seen it again. And so there's a lot of discussion of who is the Antichrist and when is the Antichrist coming and, and all that sort of thing. So I want you to notice that we let the text explain itself, okay? Let the text explain itself. When you come to a difficult passage that you don't understand, go back and read it slowly and carefully and read the verses in front of it and the verses behind it and let it speak to you. And most of the time, you will find the answer. Now, let's think this through. What would the word antichrist mean? What would that word mean? We know that Christ means the anointed one. That's what it means, the Messiah. The Hebrew word was Messiah. The Greek word was Christos, Christ, where we get Christ come from. And the English equivalent is the word anointed. So, what would be anti-Christ? That would be someone who does not believe in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, right? That part of it is fairly simple. And the text actually explains that simple thought. Okay, you have been anointed by the Holy One and you all have knowledge. Knowledge. Just hang on to that one, okay? You're going to see that over and over and over in 1 John. I write to you not because you do not know, there's the word know again, the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is Antichrist. So there you go. There's your definition there's your explanation of Antichrist. It's he, in other words, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. That is an Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. You remember when Jesus said, no one comes into the Father except by me. Remember that? John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to God except through Jesus. That's what he's saying. Now notice this. No one who denies the Son has the Father. If you don't accept who Jesus really is, I don't care what you say your relationship with God is. It's nothing. If you deny Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father. Also, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. So now, think about this. We've got some information here about people that used to be with them that have left them and we've got some information here about some people who are trying to deceive them. Now, it stands to reason then that everything that he's just said about Antichrist and not believing in the Son is connected with those who are deceiving them. And so here's the interesting thing about 1 John. You're probably not going to understand a lot of 1 John unless you understand the historical background. And I know you love history. There's so many history buffs here, and you would so enjoy if I spent 45 minutes on history. 
I'll spare you. I will give you a little bit. But notice, they went out from us. They were not of us. They denied Jesus came in the flesh. And remember this phrase about who has the Father? Who has the Father? It's not the people that deny Jesus came in the flesh. They don't have the Father. The people who have the Father are those that confess that Jesus is the Son of God. He did come in the flesh. They, those deceivers, those people who are trying to deceive them that we just read about, they are liars, John says. Man, he doesn't pull any punches, does he? They're liars. That's one of the things I love about John's writings. It's black and white, folks. I mean, he comes out and says it. They're lying and do not represent the true gospel. So let me give you a little bit of background to the false gospel that these deceivers were trying to convince these people. And these people, they did convince some of them. And they left with them. It's almost like they had started their own sect. It's like they started their own congregations, their own churches. They drew from the group of churches that John was kind of overseeing and in his area, and this created a big problem, and that's what John's dealing with. Now, you've probably all heard of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. They come in that order, by the way. Plato was a student of Socrates, and Aristotle was a student of Plato. And I've got the dates that Plato lived, and that's approximate, uh, there by his name. So this way of thinking, this philosophy, had been around quite a while, you see, three or four hundred years, okay? And... It lasted probably another three or four hundred years. So, Plato is connected with what is referred to as dualism. Dualism is a moral or spiritual belief that two fundamental concepts, opposing concepts, exist. For example, if you believe in God, his opponent is Satan. Everybody's good with that, right? God represents good. Satan represents evil. Hey, everybody's good with that. God and good are spiritual. Satan and evil are physical. Now, if you believe that, then that's going to affect what you believe about creation, and these philosophers, this philosophy believed that there's no way that a good God created the universe. A good God could not and would not have created anything material because material, physical, is evil. They actually believed a lesser being, in fact, many of them believe the devil himself created the universe. Now, can you immediately see why John has a problem with this? Sure he does. It also affects your view of Jesus. They did not believe in the virgin birth. They believed that Joseph and Mary were both the biological parents of Jesus. Okay? You think John had a problem with that? Well, of course he did. That flies in the face of everything the gospel represents and stands for. Furthermore, they did not believe Jesus the man could have been deity. In other words, he could not have been God. And so what they believed was that you remember that passage when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended upon him when he came up out of the water? Remember that? They believe that's when God entered Jesus. Before that, he was just a man like the rest of us, no different than anybody else. And then they believed that at some point before the crucifixion, 
the Spirit left Jesus because God could not have died. You see that? And so this is why this is referred to as a false gospel. And this particular philosophy, this dualism, led to a brand or a sect or form of Christianity that was not true. And it was called Gnosticism. It didn't have that word. It wasn't labeled that in John's day. But the seeds, the roots, everything were in place. And that's what all this false teaching, these deceivers were doing. They were denying Jesus came in the flesh. Why would they deny that? Because they believed the flesh was wicked, the flesh was evil. That's why. So it crept into Christianity in the first century. The word gnosis, Gnosticism comes from gnosis, which the definition is a secret, mystical, and cryptic knowledge based on direct communion with God. And they believed it was primarily for the smart people. If you were a high intellectual, if you were a brainiac, you would get this. And so here was their claims or boasts. They went something like this. God told me, God told me the truth about Jesus. God told me and others like me and we have a higher knowledge than you folks you're just plain and simple and ignorant and this knowledge from God makes us special and different we understand and you're living in ignorance you come go with us. Come with us. We have God. We know God. God has spoken to us and we know him and have him. And so if you really want salvation, you need to accept this knowledge. You need to accept this truth. And sure enough, there were people who were going after them, people who were following them. And it was hurting the church. It was splitting the church, dividing the church. Now, some of you have lived through church division. You know the pain. You know the anguish. You know the hurt. You know all that goes with it when the church is disrupted and people leave and you lose friends, you lose family, you lose all kinds of relationships and associations, and it's terrible, it's horrible. So imagine how John's congregations were feeling. What were they thinking? Well, a lot of doubt had crept in. You know, some of, those, some, these, some of these guys that can't come in here and talk, they are smarter than us. I wonder, I wonder if John has told us, that, I wonder if, if John really, has God spoke to him? like he spoke to these other guys, like they're saying? Maybe that is the way. I, I want the truth, and it sounds pretty good. You know, all of these kinds of thoughts likely were going through the minds of the recipients of 1 John. That's why this letter was written, because of all that was going on there. You see that? And so we have to keep that context in mind when we look at these passages of Scripture, okay? So don't read about the Antichrist and make some giant leap into some philosophy about eschatology or the end times that the Bible doesn't even teach. Let's keep it right here where it belongs. Now, there are some principles that are timeless and for us, and we're going to look at some of those at the end. 
Now, on the other side of this thing, what was going on, how, this is how we know about this guy named Serenthus. Serenthus was the actual person who was leading this revolt or this rebellion or this division or whatever you want to call it, okay? He believed the Gnosticism. He was a student. He believed in the teachings of Plato. And so he's the guy we're talking about here. How do we know about Serenthus? Well, there's a church father called Irenaeus, and Irenaeus is two generations down from the Apostle John, and we have some writings of Irenaeus, okay? There's a lot of history there, so we can read the writings of Irenaeus, and we learn that he was a disciple of Polycarp who was a close friend and disciple of the Apostle John. So everybody see that connection? And Irenaeus is how we learn about Serenthus. In his writings, he refers to Serenthus, who lived in the days of John, and he called him a heretic because he denied God created the world. He believed that all physical material things were evil. He believed only the spiritual, the soul was good. He distinguished between Jesus the human and Christ the Son of God. He denied the virgin birth and the resurrection. Okay? That's how we know this stuff. There are historical writings from people connected to the Apostle John, and we know what was going on. All right? So, here are some clues. Look in chapter 1. If you look at verse 6, verse 8, and verse 10, you will see the phrase, if we say. If we say. Now, when you see that, he's talking about these deceivers. He's talking about the false teachers. This is what they said. If we say we have fellowship with him, that's what they claim. They claim they had this fellowship with God. We have God. You don't. That's what they were saying. If we say we have no sin, that's what they said. They believed they were sinless. That's why in, in, in chapter 1 you read, if, you say, if we say we have no sin, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. In other words, John said, they are lying to you. They do have sin, and all you have to do is look at their life. Look at the way they treat people. And we'll get into that momentarily. Whoever says, you're going to see that three times in chapter 2. So in chapter 1, three times, you say, if we say, chapter 2, three times, whoever says, and in both cases, they're talking about the same people, okay? The opponents, the divisive people, the false teachers, they were the whoever. Whoever says, I know him, is a liar and the truth is not in him. Whoever says he abides in him, he says, okay, here, here, here's the barometer. Are they living the life that Jesus lived? They've been around you. You know them. You know who they are. You know how they've acted. You know what they've said. You know how they've treated you. Is that the way Jesus walked? Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. And there's so much in John, especially chapter 4, there's so much there about loving your brother or hating your brother that there's a heavy implication that these people, in John's eyes, hated their brothers. The way they were treating them, they hated them. So, John addresses their confusion and uncertainty. Remember, that's why he wrote this. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure. 
that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. John is saying, I'll guarantee you, you are from God. You have him, you live with him, you abide in him. I want you to have confidence. I want you to know, know what you know. You know Jesus is righteous. You know that. I want you to be sure that if you follow Jesus, if you practice righteousness, you are of God. Don't listen to what these people are telling you. You know that Jesus is righteous. You know that if you follow in his footsteps, you are of God. By this we may know. Now you're going to read this over and over and over in 1 John, okay? Now, why is that? Why does he use the word know and knowledge so many times in this? Because, remember, it was the false teachers who were claiming this special supernatural knowledge. Remember? Knowledge is what set them apart. Knowledge is what saved them. And this so-called knowledge from God did not line up with the gospel that John had taught. And so John constantly reminds them of what we know. And the things he reminds them about what they know help to solidify their faith, clear up the confusion, and expose the false teachers. Okay? By this we may know that we are in him. You see, they were doubting. They were questioning. They were wondering if the false teachers were right. Do we have God? Are we in him? Are we in Christ? By this you will know whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way he walked. You walk with Jesus, that's how you know. If your life doesn't line up with Jesus, then you know you don't abide with God. You know you're not in Him. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Look at all of these. Every one of these. Of what you know. or what, uh, 2 verse 1, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, Remember, they claim they didn't have any sin. John says, that's not right. I don't want you to sin. Don't get me wrong. Don't sin. But when you do, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus. Whoever loves his brothers in the light, little children, because your sins are forgiven. You know him who is from the beginning. You have overcome the evil one. You know the Father. And in all of these things, he, he's, he's, I didn't have it up there, but he says, I'm writing to you so that. And notice, their salvation was questioned. But John is writing so that his audience will have confidence in knowing they don't need to question their salvation. They are saved. They have the life of God. They have eternal life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it. In other words, Jesus. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifest to us. Jesus is the life. And this is the promise that he made, a, made to us. Eternal life. God promised us eternal life. And we've already read Jesus is the life. So we find that life through and in Jesus. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Again, he's referencing the divisive false teachers. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. I want you to think about that for a moment. Do you know 
that you have eternal life? Do you know that? There shouldn't be any doubt, question, or reservation about it if you're in Christ. If you're questioning whether or not you are saved, if you have committed your life to Christ, if you've re believed in the work and the person of Jesus, if you have repented of your sins, if you've been baptized into Christ, into his body, if you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, if all of that is true of you, there's no reason for you to be questioning whether or not you are with God or have God or are saved. Okay? I'm writing these things so you will know that you have eternal life. The life of God is dwelling in you. The Holy Spirit is alive and in you. The Spirit of Jesus Christ is in you. That's why you have life. Do you know that? And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true and we are in Him who is true, in His Son Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Man, that statement there flew right in the face of everything that those false teachers were saying. He is the true God. Jesus is God. That's what they're telling them. And of course they rejected that. We've come to know him. We shall be like him. We've passed out of death into life. He laid down his life for us. He abides in us by the spirit. We know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. We abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. We love God and his children when we obey his commands. That he hears us. We have the requests that we've asked of him. God protects us. We are from God. We know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him the son of god has come and has given us what's the son of god given them understanding what did the false teachers claim to have divine understanding divine knowledge john says no 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 you are the one who has received word from God in the person of Jesus Christ. You are the one who has received the truth. You are the one who God has spoken to. So that we may know him who is true, we are in him. He is the true God and eternal life. So notice throughout John, we have all these contrasts. You're either born of God or you're born of the devil. You're either in the light or in the darkness. You're either proclaiming what's true or what's a lie. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. You live a life of love or you don't live a life of love. Either you practice righteousness or you practice sinful living. It's one or the other, folks. There's not any fence riding here. You see? Not in John's eyes. And I think that probably implies that there was some of that going on. These people had left, some of them, the people that had stayed, and all their doubts and fears and questions and everything, and there were probably some people kind of caught in the middle. There were probably some people kind of saying, yeah, that sounds pretty good over there. Well, that sounds pretty good there too, you know. And John doesn't allow that sort of thing. You're either with him or you're against him so and now little children abide in him so that when he appears we may have confidence John is establishing and confirming their identity and their status based on who Jesus is and what he's done in other words he's saying 
You are born of God, and you need to have confidence in that. He affirms God's love for them as God's children, and he encourages them for the coming. You can get excited, and you can look forward to the coming of your Lord Jesus. He says, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we might be called the children of God. And then I love the next little phrase, and so we are. Yes, we are. We are the children of God. Yes. And when he comes, we, John said, I, I don't know what this is going to be like, folks. But I know this. He's coming. He is coming. And I know that when he comes, we will see him as he is, and we will be like him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. Boom. You're going to undergo a transformation that you never thought possible, that you never imagined, that's greater than anything you could possibly imagine. God has waiting for us glory. We are going to share in the glory of Jesus. We have, and if you've been doing your memorization in 1 Peter chapter 1, we have a priceless inheritance waiting for us. Hey, if you're not, if you're not memorizing 1 Peter 1, get after it, folks. That's beautiful stuff. It's beautiful stuff. It'll encourage you. And that's what he's doing with them. He's encouraging them all the way to the coming of Jesus. He says, everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. You know that Jesus appeared to take away sin. Now I want you to think about what he's saying here and the effect that this might have had, the positive effect this would have had on the, on the church. These False teachers, these people that have led people astray, look at them. Look how they're living their lives. Look how they lived while they were in your midst. And the reason they lived wicked, sinful lives and mistreated one another is because of that philosophical belief. The physical is evil. The body is physical, so the body's evil, and so that's not what matters. What matters is my soul. I got it right with God. He gave me supernatural Not It doesn't matter what I do with my body. How foolish and how ridiculous, and yet that's the reality of what was going on. And that's why John says the things that he says in this passage. This is a difficult passage. And especially depending on what translation you're reading. And this has caused many a Christian a lot of consternation and doubt about their own salvation. Right here. Because of misunderstanding and misinterpretation of what John is saying. I hope I've set enough background for you that you understand what John was dealing with. And so when you hear these words, you can put it in the proper category. John is dealing with two different classes of people. Okay? The false teachers, those that followed the Gnostic philosophies and beliefs, those that had left them, and then the people who had stayed true to the gospel. Two classes of people in his world, in his time, with real faces, and that's what he's writing about. Okay? 
John is not writing about Christians like you and I who sometimes sin. That's not what he's writing about here. Don't put yourself in this unless you don't believe Jesus came in the flesh, unless you're okay with hating others, unless you think you've received some supernatural from God that takes you away from the gospel, this, doesn't, this part right here is not talking about you. You're sinning occasionally. Okay? Get that right. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning practices lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, not so that you could continue to live in it. Jesus came to take it away. Take it away in your life. Take it away in my life. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. But remember, what did he say to this group over here? You do know him. You abide in him. You've been born of him. Remember that? Don't forget that. Don't forget everything he's already told them. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. If you want to put yourself in this, here's the simple question you ask. Am I continually, deliberately practicing a life of sin? Is that what I'm doing? Or am I continually deliberately, intentionally trying to do what's right. Does that mean I'm perfect and always going to do the right thing? No. Does that mean I'm never going to sin? No. John already dealt with that. Way back in chapter 1, he dealt with it. He already said, if we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth's not in us. If we do sin, go to Jesus. If you sin, go to Jesus. See, these people weren't going to Jesus. They were denying Jesus. They were denying him. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. I'm going to say something about you that I believe to be true and that the Apostle John said to them. If you have been born of God, you are going to by the grace of God and in your weaknesses and in your frailties by the grace of God you're going to keep on doing what's right I believe that about you you're going to keep on doing what is right you're not going to turn your heart over to sin you're not going to reject Jesus you're not going to walk away from Jesus you're going to follow him and you're going to live with him because that's what people who are born of God do that is our DNA God put it in us God stamped us sealed us with the Holy Spirit and we are his so we're not going to go over there we're not going to do that Some live in the light in Christ by the Spirit, and these live their lives loving God and others. Some live in darkness outside of Christ without the Spirit. They do not live their lives loving God and others. They intend to practice sin.
That's who they are. That's their DNA. They have no intention of living their lives as Jesus lived. Their hearts are not with him. Can that person change? Sure they can. The gospel can come to them and they can be cut to the heart. They can run to Jesus and they can be saved. They can start following Jesus. The gospel's for everybody. Anybody can start following Jesus. So, we know, we abide, we love, we practice right living, and we trust in God. That's the takeaway for you and for me. Regardless of all the history, all that happened back then in John's day, all the stuff that he was dealing with, here's what we all need to take from this section of First John, okay? You know who Jesus is. We know. We know the truth of the gospel. We know that we are born of God. We know that we are saved. We have. We have right now. We have eternal life with God. We love one another. That's who we are. That's what we do. We can't help it. We love one another because we have God's seed in us. Romans chapter 5, I think about verse 5, tells us that the Holy Spirit that we have been given pours the love of God into our hearts. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit pours love into us, and we just throw it out there for everybody around us. We practice doing what is right. We try our best to do what is right. And when we don't, when we don't, we get anxiety, we get anxious, we get afraid, we worry ourselves to death and can't sleep at night because if Jesus comes, I might not be good enough. I might not have made it. I might be lost. No, 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 no. That's not what we do. That's where grace comes in, folks. That's where grace comes in. You are not perfect. You never were. And you never will be. But praise God, somebody is perfect. And his name is Jesus. And finally, we just trust. Stuff happens in our lives. We don't know why it happens. There's a lot of things we don't understand. There's a lot of things we'd rather not live through and go through. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of suffering. There's a lot that happens in life. But for those that are born of God, we just trust the Father. We just trust the Father. We're his children, and he will take care of you. 